I understand it. When the times are changing, people get scared of things rearranging. But even history shifts when told by more voices. And not just one kind of person has all the choices. So here we are. There's no turning back. The cost that was paid for all that we had. A new era dawns as another one dies out. But today, the woman still cries out. God imagining the Trinity was in harmony. I was no United Church Embro and the surrounding community. We live stream our services on our Knox Embro Facebook page and later we upload a recording of them to our YouTube channel where they can be viewed at any time. Welcome today to our guest musician Marlene Matheson from St. Andrews United Church, Church in Brooksdale, our neighbors to the north of us. It's always great to collaborate with neighboring churches, and we are grateful that Marlene is able and willing to be with us today and play for us. Andrew uh, Elian, our musical director, director here at Knox United Church, is unwell, and so we wish uh, Andrew all the best for a speedy recovery. For thousands of years, indigenous people have walked on this sacred land, their relationship with the land is at the center of their lives and their spirituality. Knox United Church Embro is located on the unceded territory of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabek peoples. 
Treaty 29, 1827. Every day that we walk on this sacred ground, we are reminded that there were peoples here before us. And with this acknowledgement, we lift up the hard work of building right relations with our indigenous siblings. As we deepen our relationship to God and to each other, through our conversations, our singing, our praying and praise, may we strengthen, teach, and shape each other for the work God calls us to in the world. Jesus is the light of the world. The lighting of our Christ candle reminds us that Jesus is here, at the center of our lives, the center of our community, and at the center of our hearts as we gather to worship. Let us sing together our gathering song. Beyond our fears and misgivings, before the excuses and doubting, at home within the honest and vulnerable lives the healing power of God. Come, let us not pretend we do not know these places. Let us not avoid what is most real, for in the facing and accepting lives the healing embrace of God. Please pray with me. Generous creator of love and life, in your welcoming embrace lies both our hope and healing. May this be a time of prayer and listening before us, and may it be our renewal of spirit and courage for faith's journey. Amen. Let us now sing together our opening hymn from Voices United 374, Come and find the quiet center.
Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had, and she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, if I might touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately her hemorrhage stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you? How can you say who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him, and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. May God bless these words to our deeper understanding and our daily walk. Last Sunday, my colleagues and I began a six-week guest preacher series called Women Who Knew Jesus. Each week, we are taking turns reflecting on monologues from the book, And She Said, by Betty Radford Turcott, a local Canadian author. Today's monologue comes from today's scripture, Mark 5, 25 to 34, the story of the bleeding woman. Jess McPherson will read the monologue about Veronica, and then we'll hear Reverend Doug Peck's message. Veronica, the bleeding woman. There is a very happy tradition of St. Veronica. She's a pious woman of Jerusalem in the first century who was healed by touching the hem of Jesus' garment. There's another story that says a woman named Veronica followed Christ to the cross and gave him her veil to wipe his face as he carried his cross. It was said to bear the likeness of his face. This scene is the sixth station on the Via Dolorosa. If we assume this is the same woman, a story of devotion comes to life. I could think of nothing else to do. It was a great risk to do what I had planned, but I was desperate. I had been bleeding, as woman does monthly, but for 12 years. It began at a time when I first started my womanly courses. There were, were a few days when I was not bleeding, but that was of no account. The law said that I remained literally unclean for seven days after the bleeding stopped. Under this law, I was unclean all the time. That made my life unbearable. I lived with my parents, but when this bleeding continued, they found it very hard and tragic. The rules made it impossible to have me in their house. These laws of impurity shut me away from real contact for most of my days. No one could sit on a stool on which I had been sitting, so I had my own stool. I had my own dishes and a spoon, a bowl in which to wash. I washed my own clothes, bed linens, everything, for no one could touch anything that I had touched. If they did, they too would become unclean until the evening of the same day. They could not touch me either. I was never hugged. No one could brush my hair, lace my garments, hold my hand. My parents could not live like this, and so they turned me out and found me a tiny space in which to stay. They came to see me and to give me money so that I could live. But we talked through the doorway, and they never came into my little house, which was just a room with a door and one window. Life was barren cold, empty. I tried the doctors and all that did was make me poor. They could not help me. How could they when they wouldn't get near or too near touch me? They told me to drink this tea or that potion or use this salve. Nothing changed. I had to do something or I would die of a broken heart. I had heard of a healer called Jesus and I was determined to find him. But then what? I thought about it for a long time and finally decided on a plan. I would dress very plainly and hide my face. Hardly anyone knew me, but I didn't want to risk being seen or recognized. I would quietly come up to him from behind and touch his garment. 
I knew that he was a man of God, and surely God would come to my aid. As I looked to the hills and prayed, I felt at peace, and when Jesus came near my place, I was ready. I dressed with care and slipped away in the early hours of the day to go to the place where he was to come and teach. When he arrived, I knew him at once. There was such strength in his walk, such power in his face, such gentleness in his voice and compassion in his look. I was at the edge of the crowd, but slowly worked my way nearer to him, being very careful not to touch anyone. As he turned to face the great mass of people, I reached out and touched the hem of his robe. At once, I felt peace and a strength that I had not known for years. He spoke. He touched me. His disciples scoffed, but I knew that he had felt my presence. I threw myself at his feet and confessed. He smiled at me and said that my belief had been the source of my healing. Go in peace, daughter, he said in blessing. I decided that I would follow him and learn more about him and his teaching. And I did, listening and learning and helping the women disciples when I could. And I was there when he was arrested. I followed the jeering crowd as he carried his cross along the streets to the hill of crucifixion. He stumbled and I could see the blood and tears on his face. I gave him a piece of clean cloth and he wiped his brow. As he handed it back, he smiled and said, Thank you, daughter. He knew me. I could tell. He remembered. And once again, I received his blessing. In spite of the horror of that time, once again, I felt that peace. Let us pray. Holy One, may the words that come from my mouth and the meditations that are stirred in all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our strength and our sustainer. Amen. I, uh, I would like to ask all of you to please be kind to me as, uh, as I tell a bit of an embarrassing story. Um, it's about the first time I was given a list of things to buy for my wife uh, at the at the at the drugstore. I was told to um, go to the drugstore, small list of things that we needed for our, our house. And, uh, and and when I read the list, I realized there was something on that list that I had never ever purchased before from the drugstore. It was something that my wife needs, all women need, uh, one once. Uh, Every month, this is something that they need. And um, and seeing that, and that I never ever bought it before, there was there was this teenage boy inside of me that got a little squeamish, being being the first time I had ever purchased these things. I, I, I thought to myself, well, how do I do this? What's the what's the mannerisms I need to carry? And, uh, well, how, how do how do I go about doing this? And and uh, that time in the drugstore was different than, than any other times before, and, and I had to have this adrenaline going, and I had to be focused and buy things and be grown up and just go to the checkout and give my, my credit card, and I got a receipt, and there was this moment where I thought, I did it. I did it, and maybe I could even do it again. Maybe, maybe some people might even call me a hero, but probably uh, those people would be uh, seen as pathetic for saying such things. Because if, if we were to compare my uh, experience to Veronica's experience, there's just, there's just no comparison. And I do think Veronica should be called a, a hero. And, and there's so many reasons, and, and I want to get more into that uh, very, very soon. But first I want to talk about uh, her experience and what suffering she has been under because of it. So, uh, for her, menstruation begins. The only problem is, it doesn't stop. Well, it did stop for three days, as, as we heard. But the purity code, is, as we heard about in, in uh, the chapter, and, and, and she said by Betty Radford Turcott, lets us know that by purity code standards, you're unclean, you're impure for seven days after. And so she never became officially unclean 
This affected her within her family in a drastic, drastic way. It meant that she could never stop being distant from her family, using different things. It, it got to the point where she needed her own bowl, her own stool, her own uh, utensils, her own everything. And she needed to do everything for herself. This became so exhausting for her family that they needed to just get her a different place. Right? There's heartache in this, isn't there? Thinking, didn't they love her? But after we've been through a pandemic, and, and many of us have had to undergo this kind of isolation from our own families uh, to live up to the health codes that, that we have been doing. My goodness, we're not even in the same sanctuary together right now. And it's not necessarily because we don't love each other, it's because we genuinely, genuinely believe that we are behaving in the right way to do all this. Veronica, respecting her family, respecting her community and her ways, continues to carry through with these rules, even though it has made her so distant and so poor. She can't make her own living. Her parents have to deliver everything, deliver her, her money even. And all that has been wasted to doctors who help. Not at all. They help by not even getting close to her, by not even understanding what the real problem is, by saying, buy this tea, buy this salve. None of it works. She is completely desperate and has no idea what to do. And she's been living this way for 12 years. 12 years. And as much as she respects the laws and the codes, it has become utterly exhausting. Her suffering is great. And maybe some of us haven't suffered to her extent. We have suffered in some way. And I'm going to ask us to just keep that in mind and in the back of our heads and in the back of our hearts. Brennan Brown, uh, a PhD social worker and, and a shame expert, shame and vulnerability expert. She calls uh, what Veronica is going through a, a day two experience. And, and she talks about uh, this notion day two in, in her books and on one of her podcasts uh, uh, that, that uh, I'll, I'll post on social media. I, I just want everybody to listen to this. It's, it's pretty wonderful. But day two for her uh, speaks of, uh, of a training session that her and her colleagues used to run to teach other therapists about um, shame and, and how to help other people uh, process their shame as therapists and counselors. And, and she says, on day one, you're getting used to the information, you're, you're, you're uh, getting an overview of things, but on day two, all of a sudden, you're applying it in real deep ways, and, and you're asking people to, to dig deep and, and look into a really difficult topic like, like shame and vulnerability. And, uh, and then day three, get the certificate, everybody's happy. But day two, she says, it's messy and there's no other way for it to be anything but messy. Day two, um, she gets evaluations back of, uh, of how the training went. And everybody says, love the course, but man, day two was horrible. And, and you got to make it easier for us. Could you make day two easier? And, and she laughs about this because... Uh, day two is a messy thing in this kind of training. She she compares it to um, uh, the Air Force, and the Air Force has this has this uh, expression that you're up in the air and you've gone so far that you can't turn around and come back. You don't have the fuel for that. There's a certain point of no return, 
very literally, where you have to keep going forward. Day two is a process where you can't just go back and be safe. You have to keep going forward. And, and she even talks about how Pixar, in their movie making, Pixar, the animated movie company, in their movie making process, this is what they acknowledge as act two in their movie making. In a three act movie, act one, you set things up. You set up the world, you set up the characters, you set up uh, the potential problems that are, are going to arise, and that happens at the end of Act 1. Act 2 is when the main character starts to have to deal with this process. So what do we do when we want to stay so comfortable and safe? We figure out every single safe way to solve the problem without getting too mucky or messy. But every option is exhausted. And the main character hits this point where they realize none of these things are working. And by the end of Act 2, always for this story writing process, the main character realizes there is no way I can solve my problem without being vulnerable without being vulnerable, without risking something so great, realizing I can't do this on my own, I can't hide my problems away. I've got to let this messiness get a little worse before it's going to get better. I think we, we really understand this on a human level. And this is, this is a point that becomes bizarrely beautiful for Brene Brown because she says it's in that day two space where we learn about ourselves. And when we learn in a very deep way that makes us grow in a very big way. Now first, I, I want to I want us to think about who we're vulnerable with and who's vulnerable with us. I, I remember a friend uh, once saying something so insightful to me. I, they, they were, we were talking about someone else and, and, and this friend was a little frustrated. But they were saying, you know, I think we could be better friends if only he were vulnerable. He's never vulnerable. And as sad as my friend was, it's, it's a powerful point because you think about your best of relationships and who you are with them and who they are with you. And laughter and joy is always a part of that. But I think something even greater is that vulnerability is a part of that. There's somebody you can be vulnerable with and there's someone who they are someone who trusts you, that they can be vulnerable with you. How endearing is that? If you, if you think about that person for a moment, how endearing is that if someone can be vulnerable and chooses you to be vulnerable with them? How trusted do you feel? How much closer do you feel to that person for being vulnerable? I also, uh, and this is all going in the direction of, uh, as Brene Brown says, and as the Pixar model shows it, of being a hero. That Act 3 is, is taking that vulnerability and, and making it a part of the hero's journey that we've, we've heard about before. And, I, and I, want, I want you to think about some of the heroes that you have, and how vulnerability is a part of what makes them so heroic. And, and, and for me, uh, my, my own congregation will remember last, about a year ago, in, in March, I, I suffered a, a concussion. I, I was so excited for winter to be over, I wanted us to have play equipment again in, in my yard, because we're going to be isolated more and more and more. Uh, my, I wanted the play equipment to be up and running. There was, there was a swing set all over the place, and who knows what else was dismantled, all because uh, I, I wanted to make an ice rink in a certain place. And putting up this, this swing set again 
lightning to bonking my head with a four by four. Man, it hurt. And there was a concussion that followed. And the instinct with the concussion sometimes, right, is that, oh, come on, just tough this up. Come on, just keep going. And, and I'm so thankful to, uh, to one of our worship committee members that, that just said, Doug, that is the dumbest thing you could do. Just, just take the time that you need to, to heal and be vulnerable. I'm grateful for that wisdom, but I'm also grateful for the vulnerability of someone like Sidney Crosby, who has shown the world that he's not going to mess with certain things like that. Yeah, he's big and strong and athletic and capable and powerful, but he's not afraid to just take the time and go against the culture that says, tough it out. And for him to get back to that hero standard that he is to so many people, it's about letting his body be in a place where he's vulnerable. That was strong for me. Someone else that I'm thinking about right now is Selena Gomez. She has required a new kidney because of lupus. Kidney disease became a part of her story. And a lot of you know this is powerful for me because my brother is in a similar situation. Kidney disease has landed him in a place where he requires dialysis, and it's frustrating. He doesn't like dialysis. It doesn't agree with him. He is without energy, without a job. He's frustrated by this. And here, Selena Gomez is this living proof of the of the powerful journey that is getting a new kidney. And she's very open about this. She's very vulnerable with this story. She's very appreciative of her friend, Francia Raitza, who said, I'll donate a kidney to you. And together they, they show their scars. They tell their story. They talk about how scary it was. But they're talking about it from a place where they are strong and okay. And what a place of hope it brings me to. I almost feel like writing Sidney Crosby and Selena Gomez, a fan mail from a 42-year-old guy saying, thank you for your vulnerability. Maybe that would be weird to them, I don't know. But their vulnerability is heroic to me. And that is exactly why Veronica is the hero that she is. She's at the end of day two. She's at the end of act two. She's saying, forget this. I am done with being ashamed. This is my life. I'm not dealing with this anymore. And I've heard of one who heals and she has accepted that she can't do it by all these other means that have just not worked. She's ready to throw a Hail Mary. She, she finds Jesus in the crowd. She doesn't care that there's people everywhere that might consider her unclean. She respectably, she respectably stays away from breaking any kind of rules by touching them, but she gets close, close enough to touch the hem of Jesus' robe and does so. And right away, Jesus says, who did that? Saying to the disciples, who touched my robe? Feeling the power leave his body. And the disciples are like, come on, Jesus. How could we, like, how could you begin to even try to think about whose role God touched here. Jesus isn't frustrated and, and, and wanting to discover to chastise anybody. Jesus is aware that there is a hero amongst this crowd who realizes where the power is how to draw closer to God's divine self, how to find saving from the one we call Savior. 
and her, still in a place of deep vulnerability, admits and confesses the most vulnerable time of all in Christ in front of everybody, points this out and says, this is faith, everyone. This is what I want everyone to understand faith to be. It's almost like a coach saying, everybody, be more like that. Everybody, when you're learning how to, how to stop in hockey, you hear that noise, you hear that sound. It's coming from that, be like that person. Modeling it for, for everyone to see. And, and, and a couple of my favorite theologians, they, they have this podcast, Caroline Lewis, uh, who loves the, the, uh, the, the miracle stories. Gospel of John is, is filled with miracle stories. But her, her colleague who does the podcast with her at Luther uh, Seminary Theological School in, in, uh, in St. Paul, Minnesota, um, Rolf Jacobson, he, he, he is a double amputee himself from, from a cancer uh, surgery in, in 2000 when he, was, when he was a teenager. And, and he says, you know, healing stories like this are problematic for people uh, in the disability community. Because sometimes we hear a message that have faith and you'll get better magically. But today, that's not what this is about. This is a conversation between God and us about shame being hard. It is our cross. But it's not the end. And it's in that process of walking through it that we want to hide from it and hide from everyone else that we're being asked to trust and reach out and see a God that takes our hand and brings us closer in relationship when we display our vulnerability to God. God finds that so endearing. We're told about an Easter morning arising beyond all suffering, which is the true blessing meant for each and every one of us and requires that hero moment in Act 3, where we realize the strength for us is also a part of our own accepting of being weakness. But like Veronica drawing upon the strength of our God and our Savior, Amen. Let us pray. For the sake of others and for the sake of ourselves, we come to you, O God. We seek words that convey grace. We seek touch that brings healing. We seek power that does good. We seek you. Hear us. Touch us. Heal us. Send us. In Jesus Christ. Amen. Join me now as we sing hymn, Voices United 161, I Have Called You By Your Name. No, it's more voices. Did I say more voices? More voices. 161.
of gifts, both local and to the Mission and Service Fund, we do justice, show kindness, and are humble and obedient servants of God. With joyful hearts, let us present our gifts. loving God, source of all justice, we ask now that you bless our gifts and those given through par. May they become part of your mission for all creation. May our gifts touch and change lives, communities, and congregations, so that our mission and your purpose are one. Thanks be to God. Amen. I think the thing that I most appreciate about a community of faith is that we never have to go it alone. Perhaps that's why so many of us are struggling with feelings of isolation during this pandemic. We may have gifts to share, but it is challenging sometimes to do church the way we have always been doing church for decades. Because during this time of the pandemic, we've had to make many adjustments. But we can still support each other and remind each other that we are not alone. We are always able to support the work of creating God's kingdom. Maybe we can help financially by supporting one of Knox's outreach projects. Or maybe we can simply call the people working on some of the church projects and encourage them and thank them for the work they do. How great would it be for each of us to contact a member of our church council and thank them for their time, their dedication, their passion, and their gifts? This has not been an easy time for the council to make important decisions about the church during the pandemic. Don't ever think that you don't have a purpose or value or a role to play in the building of the kingdom. We all do. Deb Harris and I are starting a weekly uh, walking group called Community Spirit Walkers. And we're going to be meeting on Wednesdays starting this week, February the 2nd at 3 p.m. at the Ambrosora Community Center to gather in a safe way so we can walk the indoor trails. Uh, you can find out details in our church announcements. And if you don't receive our church announcements, please email us at knoxambro at gmail.com and ask to be added to our email list. Will you pray with me, please? Broken bodies, shamed peoples, and ravaged ecosystems. It's not the world of your making, O oh God, but it is the world in which we live and daily seek to make a positive difference. In the silence and led by your spirit, we yearn for healing. We wait for your saving presence. Deceit of the powerful, complicity of the masses, and wars that mostly injure the innocent. It's certainly not your reign, O oh God, but it is the world in which we live and daily seek to make a positive difference. In the silence and led by your spirit, we yearn for healing. We wait for your saving presence. Exclusive religions, truths set in stone and leaders beyond accountability. It's not what Jesus hoped and prayed for, but it is the world in which we live and daily seek to make a positive difference. In the silence and led by your spirit, we yearn for healing. We wait for your saving presence. Bless us now as we pray in the way of Jesus, saying our heavenly parent, our mother, and our father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us sing together our closing hymn from Voices United 509, I, the Lord of Sea and Sky.
friends, be part in the spirit of the gospel. And where you are able, be the healing hands of God. Accepting, encouraging, and peaceable hands. We go in peace. We go in the name of Christ. And as we go, may we know that the mystery that is the love of God, the compassion that is the peace of Jesus, and the companionship of the empowering Holy Spirit are with us now and always. Amen. God's healing love.